Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I have the commissioners here. I want to welcome everybody to this uh, press avail. We have an hour. Excuse my dogs. Um, <laughs> we will uh, get going right away. And let's start with um, Jerry Cornfield from the Everett Herald. Jerry, if you want to unmute your thing and ask your question. Okay, if I could, I just uh, thank you very much for uh, commissioners for being here. And uh, two questions they are related to just what happened on Monday night. Um, I was hoping that each of you could describe a, a little more detail of what you were doing between say 7 and 10 p.m. if you were specifically negotiating with people of the other party or amongst yourselves on the Democrat side and Republican side. So what were you doing? And then secondly, these final maps uh, or the maps you released uh, Tuesday evening and sent to the Supreme Court, did each of you see the maps before they were sent to the Supreme Court? And if so, how far prior to their sending to the Supreme Court did you see them? Thank you. Questions for, for want of anybody else uh, answering first, I'd be happy to give you my views of what happened on Monday night. Um, it was chaotic, as you could tell. Uh, we were all tired and uh, we were toward the end and very close to negotiating agreement that we could then turn into the actual maps themselves. We had set for ourselves a 5 p.m. deadline uh, of what either we reached agreement or we would not. And 5 p.m. came and while we didn't have agreement at that point, we were very, very close. And we decided, or at least I decided, I don't know about anybody else, but I decided I wanted to keep trying. So we had until midnight and uh, it was, we were uh, in partisan, we call them dyads. So it was me and Commissioner Fain, and then I think Commissioner Sims and Commissioner Wapenshaw um, separately. And the, what, much of what we were doing was receiving offers, full map offers. Um, from one side, reviewing them, analyzing them, then working with our mapping staff to draw full map responses. And um, so during that time, that's a lot of what we were doing. We had some technical issues at the time as well, which, which added to all the confusion and everything else. But uh, for those last little hours, we were uh, sending full map offers back and forth and seeing if we could get to a point where we would reach agreement on maps. And to answer your second question, I did see both of the maps before they went to the Supreme Court. And I saw them, each one probably an hour or two uh, before they were sent over, but I had been involved with, uh, with mapping staff from both parties who were drawing them at the time. So I felt very comfortable that those maps reflected the agreement that we had reached uh, around midnight on Monday. Just to be clear, could the other commissioners on the Supreme, the map sent to Supreme Court clarify whether you also saw them an hour or two before, or did any of you see them right before? Thank you. I'm happy to answer that question, um, or at least dive in and create space for my fellow commissioners. Um, I, I want to echo to your first question what Commissioner Graves uh, indicated in terms of what we were working on between the hours of 7 and uh, 12 o'clock and our sincere um, efforts to reach agreement. I think we knew that we were quickly approaching the deadline and had thought, you know, we're getting closer and closer. Are we really, are we going to be able to come to a deal? Um, we spent a lot of time mapping scenarios and exchanging proposals. Um, in terms of the maps and whether or not I saw them before they went to the Supreme Court, I did. Um, I saw them, you know, sometime early in the morning on Tuesday, um, and these maps have my full support. Commissioners Fain or Walkinshaw? I'll go ahead. Um, great to see you all. Um, to your first question of what was happening between the hours of 7 and 10 p.m., uh, similar to what Commissioner Graves said, it was chaotic. Um, we were working together in kind of small groups and partisan dyads. Um, so Commissioner Stems and I were together. Um, we were exchanging uh, numbers. Um, we were exchanging um, ideas for different districts. Um, we were uh, looking over those um, between um, different groups as we worked to reach uh, a negotiated consensus. Um, so that is what was happening between the hours of seven and 10. Um, 
at least for me. Um, and then I would say in terms of the maps themselves, um, the, the, the final maps that were transmitted to the court, um, in my mind, reflect the agreement that we voted on. Um, and I would also add to your question, did I see them? Um, I, I did have the opportunity to see the final um, congressional map. Um, I, I have since seen the, the, the legislative map, um, but uh, that, that's, that they do reflect the agreement that, that I voted on, on on Monday night. Yeah, I think the uh, complexity here is with uh, the time that you provided that 7 to 10 p.m. Um, can't say that I was looking at my watch for the entire time, but I would say that uh, other than to see when that deadline was fast approaching, um, there was a period of time there where there was um, a lull in communication, certainly. Um, but as the other uh, commissioners um, characterized, there was uh, a lot of feverish uh, time spent in our partisan dyads over a computer and mapping software. Um, the uh, final maps I did review uh, prior to their transmittal to the Supreme Court and I echo uh, some of my other uh, colleagues and that they have my full support. Okay, um, let's next move to uh, Laurel Demkovich with the spokesman review. Laurel. Thanks. Um, I just kind of want to get some clarification on again what happened on Monday. So at the end of the night you had these very quick votes, but the maps apparently were not done. So can you just explain what exactly you all thought you were voting on at that point? I'm happy to start. I mean, what I what I felt I was voting on um, was an agreement. Um, and, it, and it was a it was a set of um, it was basically a framework um, for around the, the, the kind of the in some cases geographies and in some cases the performance of different districts. Um, but it was an agreement that was within a framework that we've been working on for, for quite a while. So I felt like I was voting on an agreement. I'll say a, a similar answer as well. I, I, what I felt we were voting on was, you could call it a framework, but it was a framework that was, uh, that it was you, know, you could immediately translate. I say immediately, it actually takes seven or eight hours to do it, but that you could immediately translate into the maps themselves. And uh, I should make abundantly clear here too. I don't know where my fellow commissioners are on this. The way that meeting happened on Monday and everything, I personally did not feel lived up to the transparency that I expect um, of my government and that the people deserve. And um, I didn't like that. And the only explanation I can give you is that we were, we had the potential to reach agreement on these maps, which is a very important thing to me. And so we chose to keep moving forward. And the agreement that, that we had, again, was a framework that we could turn into maps uh, that took several hours to do, but that was what I wanted to at least get on the record saying that, this, that the framework that we were voting on was the framework that I agreed to. Yeah, I'll add that. I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner. Oh, thank you, Joe. Um, I just want to add to that. Um, you know, I think that we worked incredibly hard over the last 10 months to um, be transparent, to set up a process that had uh, a high standard for transparency um, and inclusion. And it is uh, my deep disappointment and regret that in the final hours, we failed to live up to that high standard. Um, I, I echo that I don't think any of us feel great about that. Um, and I think just in the confusion um, and in the mad rush to try to meet our deadline, um, we did fail in that effort. Um, in terms of what we voted on, it was, a, it was an agreement. Um, we did have maps, um, various maps. And I think it, the time that it took to reconcile those maps and uh, make sure that they match the agreement um, is really you know, where we got hung up. And, um, but I will add that the agreement was very specific, right? There were very specific things in that agreement around the performance of specific districts and what those numbers uh, needed to look like, uh, what cities needed to be consolidated in what districts. So it was a very specific agreement and just took a little bit of time to reconcile between our uh, various maps and uh, articulate into the final product. I was just going to concur with uh, both my colleagues there on their assessment of the situation. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to remind the press the room, if you do want to ask a question, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen. And uh, next we will go to uh, Joe O'Sullivan from the Seattle Times. Joe, do you want to unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I keep hearing two different things that there was either a framework or an actual agreement. Um, did everybody see, uh, like April mentioned, the specific list of what you were actually voting on when you took the vote? And were there any discussions or negotiations uh, after midnight last uh, uh, that night, uh, early Tuesday morning? I can say whether you call it a, a framework or, or an agreement, it was sufficiently detailed that uh, all that was required was to translate it into the actual maps. It takes time to do that because we mentioned kind of you know performance here of districts. To be really clear on that, at least on the, on the we were using particular metrics. Like for example, on the legislative side, we had agreed to use the results from the 2020 state treasurer's race as a as a as a, a metric to compare current performance in districts versus potential performance in districts from the maps. And we reached specific agreements on those that you can then translate immediately into the maps themselves. It requires going block by block, which which takes time. But whether you call it a framework or an agreement, in my mind, it was both something that, you know, ultimately, you know, it was tentative, obviously. We we knew we couldn't um, ask everybody, hey, do you agree before we actually went on? So that vote at midnight was, in my mind, not agreed until we actually voted for it. But it was, um, sufficiently specific that you could without discretion then turn it directly into maps and so we I, we did not have negotiations after that we simply uh, sat with our mapping staffs together and uh, went through the process of turning that specific framework or agreement in directly into maps and so just to say I, I just to be clear to your question um, I felt that I was voting on an agreement um, and that there was no map at the time. We translated that agreement into a map after the midnight deadline. Um, but I, I did I did vote on an, on an agreement um, that, similar to what Commissioner Graves said, um, was spelled out um, with a set of kind of detailed lists of um, performance and some geographic um, some geographic specificity um, in different places. Um, for instance, uh, one an example of that was that the the Lummi and the Nooksack um, tribal lands would be unified in the 42nd legislative district. So that that was the flavor of it. But at the time of the vote, we did not have maps. Those were drawn in my mind. Those were drawn afterward. There were several versions and drafts that we had all been working from. Um, but I felt like I voted on an agreement um, at at mid, around midnight of on um, Monday. And the second question was, was anybody negotiating on any aspect of that uh, deal after midnight? No. We were simply doing the work of translating the agreement itself directly into the maps. I'll second that, no. There was not any negotiation, but we were you know, rebalancing the population and um, fixing, making sure that our agreements also meet, met our statutory uh, requirements and and led to districts that were contiguous and compact um, that had the you know correct uh, population balance and working working in the margins on some of those things. Yeah, and I'll just add that when you you know we had the we had the the agreement, um, but in the mapping process, uh, you you would do make I mean just to what Commissioner Sims said, there were you know you you're looking at population balancing, you're, you're aligning map boundaries with the agreement. Um, so there is a process that took place, um, you know, from in, 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 in that period around, around mapping. Okay. So it uh, sounds like you were still making some decisions around the specifics of uh, some of those things after midnight. Uh, I mean, you, you could call it. So, yeah, I guess I mean, there were decisions. Um, you know, you, we we had agreements on you know either particular political performance or particular actual boundaries themselves, uh, and then to translate that into the actual maps themselves, you've got to go through and decide this particular block or that particular block. But it wasn't uh, you know they weren't discretionary decisions. They were just decisions to make sure that you know, in the process of turning the agreement into the maps themselves, you actually resulted in maps that met the specific agreement. Okay, and um, 
Next question will be to Daniel Walters of the Inlander. Daniel, if you want to unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I guess I'm a little, a little confused. Uh, you know, several of you mentioned that you felt that there uh, had been a, a commitment to transparency that had, had uh, been failed. I guess I'm trying to understand um, what decisions were made um, that ended up failing that commitment to transparency and who made those decisions and um, why those decisions were made specifically. I'd be happy to jump in. Uh, you saw that we had a 7 p.m. scheduled meeting. And again, our uh, we had set for ourselves an internal deadline of 5 p.m. to either have an agreement or say we don't have an agreement. And when 5 p.m. came, we did not have an agreement, uh, even a tentative agreement, but we were close. And I can't speak for my other commissioners, but at that moment and then for the rest of the night, um, I chose to try to keep working toward a deal because we had until midnight. and what that meant was continuing to sit in our partisan dyads, work with our mapping staff to send and receive and prepare full map offers. And as a result of that, you saw that meeting, um, which was chaotic and which had several breaks in it because we were just, you know, sitting in our rooms with our mapping teams, drawing up maps. And um, I'm not proud of that decision. Um, I wanted this to go very differently, but I ultimately decided that if we had the potential to get to agreement on maps that I wanted to pursue that. And, and sorry, why wasn't the, um, why wasn't the, the kind of negotiation before 5 p.m.? Why wasn't that in public? Over the course of this whole year, we have been uh, negotiating in partisan dyads. Um, largely it was me and Commissioner Sims uh, working substantially on the legislative maps, Commissioner Fain and Commissioner Walkinshaw talking largely about the congressional maps. And we knew several things in those partisan dyads. We knew that uh, we couldn't actually reach any agreement, even if Commissioner Sims and I you know, said, yes, this is it, we're done. We knew that we would still have to uh, get at least one of our colleagues to support that. And that's how we did, you know, because we were negotiating in partisan dyads without a majority We of uh, the commission. That's how we functioned for the year. That's how we, we sent offers back and forth and, and discussed them and negotiated them. And uh, again, our goal was to try to get to tentative agreements on both of those things that we would then at 7 p.m. present and talk about and try to convince our other colleagues who were not in our dyads to support them. But uh, ultimately, again, that, that meeting instead turned into continued negotiations right up until midnight. And why do those negotiations and those partisan dyads, why did it have to be in, in private as opposed to in public? Last question, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it would have to or not. I knew that, that because we it, it was not a majority of the commission, the Open Public Meetings Act did, did not require us to. And I, I would say at least part of the answer, at least from my point of view, was that um, Commissioner Sims and I had a what I view as a really tremendous working relationship. Um, it was challenging because she's very good at this. Uh, but it was I thought it was really fruitful. And it led to and it involved a number of times where it would be a quick phone call here or there suggested ideas. Hey, if I did something like this, what would you think about that? And uh, those, it was easier to negotiate that way. And I think a more fruitful way to, to see if we could reach an, a tentative agreement to do it that way, rather than to have every single one of them, you know, fully noted 24 hours ahead of time and do it in public and things like that. It, that's, I think, why we ended up doing largely our negotiations that way. Okay. Any other commissioners want to come in on that? Or should we move on? All right, let's move on to uh, Sydney Gonzalez from the Wenatchee World. Sydney, if you could unmute your microphone and ask your question. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could, <clears throat> sorry, I'm wondering if you could um, explain a little bit the changes that you guys would make to the 12th uh, legislative district, um, specifically splitting up Douglas and Chelan counties, which um, historically have worked together on everything from port to health district to homeless task force. Um, um, so why was that decision made and, and how would it not be breaking up a community of, of interest? I'll jump in because I think that's a that's a really tough one. Um, and of course, invite the rest of my uh, fellow commissioners to, to add to what I have to say. But I think it's, um, you know, there are a series of really difficult decisions that we had to make throughout this process 
the um, challenge of trying to balance the population in Eastern Washington, pull approximately 60,000 folks from Western Washington. We knew we had to cross the cat or we had to cross the cascade somewhere. Um, and the decision to cross Highway 2 was just ultimately where we landed as a result of a number of other decisions that we had made in the map. And, um, you know, I think this, uh, what I've learned throughout this process is that uh, it is, it's a series of, there are a number of decision points and every decision point has um, a potential consequence or impact someplace else in the map. And um, that is probably one that will, um, you know, uh, generate no small amount of criticism. I just uh, echo what Commissioner Sim said. Um, the statute talks about keeping communities of interest together. It talks about not breaking city boundaries. It talks about keeping counties uh, together. Um, but then at the end of all of that, there's the math. And either you can accomplish that with districts that are all the same size with population, or you can't. And the reality is, in every part of the state, that's just not physically uh, possible to do. And so you'll find places in the, in the map. Uh, this is one example. I believe Aberdeen is another example um, that uh, the break in the community of interest is real and it is disappointing. Um, and so while I say I support these maps and the compromise that they reflect, uh, there's no question that, that there aren't places throughout this map where each one of the commissioners would point to and say, boy, I wish we didn't do that. But in the end, that was what the compromise um, forced us to agree to. So to your specific point about the split between Chelan and Douglas County, I think it's a terrible error and clearly splits up a community of interest, but does so uh, in service of the of the larger need to get a map that uh, is uh, has balanced population as the statute requires. I'll add here too specifically on the math. If you add up all the counties in Eastern Washington, the population and you divide by the 157,200 people that you need for every district, you will find yourself with a remainder of about 60,000 people. What that meant is that no matter what we did, you have to you have to have some east side district or districts take about 60,000 people from some west side district or districts. And there is no good way to do that. No, no matter how you do it, it is gonna be a challenge. You go over a pass or you go over Clark County and, it, and it's not, there's no good way to do it. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we had to get, you have, you have to do it. You have to do it because the math requires it. And we just ultimately did result, you know, we ended up with crossing largely over Highway 2. And that resulted in the 12th that had to be brought over west, which meant splitting up in Chelan and Douglas, which I agree is not ideal, but the math requires it. Okay, we move on. Um, Rich Smith from The Stranger, you'd like to unmute your mic and ask your question. Thanks. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, for anyone who wants to answer, will you just release the agreement or framework document that you were looking all that you were looking at um, before it got turned into a map? Uh, and then to what extent were you considering saving incumbents? I heard that on the legislative side, the final map saves all incumbents except for uh, Senator Hasegawa. Is that true? I can answer that last one, no. Um, uh, I think I'm gonna get it right. Uh, we can confirm this in writing afterward, but I believe on the legislative map, uh, the legislators districted out are Jeremy Defoe from the 15th, Vicki Kraft from the 17th, Bob Hasegawa from the 11th, uh, Shelly Kloba from the first. I think that might be it. Um, Roger Goodman? Oh, Roger Goodman from the 45th. And I've forgotten your first question. Will you just release the document uh, or whatever the agreement or framework? I don't know what we're calling the thing you were looking at that wasn't the maps, but <laughs> can you release that thing that just had a list of stuff that you wanted to translate into map form? Um, can you release that? When will you release that? You will certainly release. Uh, all public records, including that, I will say at least on the on the legislative side, uh, uh, we're certainly really releasing you know the full map offers that we were proposing back and forth, um, with the caveat that I was very tired Monday night and it was chaotic and hazy. 
uh, I'm not sure there was a specific document that reflected the final one. There might be, but I, I can't recall it or place it in my, my mind right now. But ultimately, uh, the, on the legislative map anyway, our final negotiations involved a particular part of student performance in a couple of key legislative districts. And it, again, it, I'll, I'll go back and look for, for actual documents on it, but it, it may have been uh, uh, a spoken word offer for the, for the very final steps that we needed to reach that agreement. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we exchanged some um, map proposals um, and there was some, some proposals in writing in those emails, but most of our negotiations was, you know, around a couple of very specific districts. And so our final, you know, it, it came down to the 44th, the 47th and the 28th um, in the final hours. And I don't think there was anything in writing um, regarding our proposals back and forth, uh, but more uh, uh, verbal negotiations. So you voted on an agreement that was ver ver verbal? There was no object over which you were voting. <laughs> you know, sorry, sorry if I'm being weird, but I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. You say you voted over an agreement that then got translated into a map. And then I'm like, okay, well, what was the, the nature of the agreement? And, it's, and then I'm hearing the nature of the agreement was there were some emails and also some verbal uh, confirmation around three districts and all four commissioners agreed on the, the, the that those, um, those, those verbal agreements uh, around those districts. It's, I understand where your confusion is coming from. And I don't mean to add to it. Uh, the, uh, it was on the legislative side again, uh, that, you know, over the course of months, we, um, came to sort of tentative agreements on districts um, and, you know, reached the point where we'd say, okay, maybe we can lock that one in and move on to the next one. Um, and the, at the very end of the day, again, like right at the end, it was kind of partisan, particular partisan performance in three legislative districts. Uh, but then once that was, once Commissioner Sims and I reached tentative agreement on that, then uh, that, was the, that was the final piece to for the rest of the map and for the rest of the agreement. Yeah, and I think, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh no, please. Well, I was just gonna say, I think, um, you know, we did have a base map that we were uh, negotiating around. There were some things that um, clearly made sense in terms of, you know, like who would, we would accept uh, the Republicans drawing of Eastern Washington with the exception of a couple of districts. They would accept our drawing of uh, King County with the exception of a couple of districts that we were negotiating around. We had you know, solid agreement around consolidating Was Washougal and Camas in, um, in one district, agreement around only uh, dividing Vancouver into two separate legislative districts. There were some very specific things um, that we had negotiated that are you know, both contained, I think, in email um, and, you know, just things that after weeks of negotiating these maps, um, we, you know, can rattle off the top of our head. Okay, I'll move on to uh, Kate Smith with the Yakima Herald. Kate, if you'll unmute your mic, you can ask your question. Hi, thank you for your time. How much of a role did the discussion of a Latino voter majority district in the Yakima Valley play in the missed deadline? And can you describe the changes uh, that were agreed to in legislative districts 13, 14, and 15? I hope it was, will come as no surprise that that was a major point of negotiation and discussion. You saw much of it publicly. Um, and it was a challenging issue to work through because many of the things that we're, we were talking about and negotiating are things that um, we, you know, we know we have to get to a certain number of population and we know um, that we're trying to keep communities of interest together, but largely we had a lot of discretion for how to draw a number of the districts. The Yakima district in particular was really challenging because it wasn't just trying to negotiate which communities would be involved in that district and uh, what uh, the Hispanic or Latino population would look like, but there was also uh, both, there was also substantial discussion and I think fair to say, conflicting views about what the law itself required, both the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. 
and that was a that made it extra challenging. Um, and ultimately, what we what you have there in the 15th district is a district where uh, a majority of it's a majority Latino district, a majority of the citizens of voting age population, so uh, eligible voters are Hispanic. Um, and to, to do that, it requires you, you kind of see the shape of it. It's not, um, you know, it's it, it reaches out to a couple of different areas to get to those populations. But um, while it was a big challenge, uh, you know, ultimately we, we reached agreement on that particular um, district. Uh, it involved obviously a compromise um, among different both mapping views and legal views. But ultimately, I think it's one that, from my point of view at least, complies with the law and advances some good things in Yakima. And I'll add to that, it was a significant, uh, we spent a significant amount of time um, discussing uh, the Yakima area. And I do wanna thank uh, Commissioner Brady Walkinshaw for his leadership um, in the Yakima region and for making it a priority for us. I was grateful to follow his lead and I don't know if he wants to jump in and. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, this, I think, was one of the, you know, let me just be clear as we, I, 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 am, I am in support of the vote that we took on Monday night. And I, this was, this is a negotiated process, right? We reached a negotiated compromise um, that would then be translated to maps. Um, and let me be on this point, I, I do think this was one of the issues of greatest contention um, in the process, um, but we did reach a negotiated end um, to this that was translated in maps. And I think that you'll see this as, you know, in, in, we borne out in public record that I, I, there, different commissioners had different views on this issue um, around the, the meaning of the, uh, the Voting Rights Act um, and the implementation of that. Um, but ultimately we did all vote for the, the agreement that reflects the, the district as, as Commissioner Graves um, describes it. I just wanna say quickly, I misspoke earlier, it was uh, Senator Hobbs for perhaps obvious reasons that was redistricted out and not um, uh, Representative Goodman. Um, I'd agree that uh, in this part of the uh, state uh, probably took a, a great deal of, of the attention of commissioners. And certainly there was a lot of conversation um, from the public about, about this area. I think the resulting district is uh, certainly overwhelmingly um, the uh, uh, Hispanic, at least if you were to look at the term that is used in Dave's redistricting. Um, and also is a majority uh, citizens of voting age population using the 2019 uh, uh, US, U.S. survey uh, data, ACS. Um, I think that we try to maintain a very flexible stance because this was a very important thing for the um, uh, Democratic commissioners in, in particular. And, uh, you know, what results probably uh, uh, complies with um, the VR, the requirements of the VRA. And I know there's a lot of continued interest in that issue. So I don't think the conversation around that has necessarily gone away. Okay. Um, let's move along. Um, I'm gonna try to get this right. Nick Geranios with the Associated Press. We got that 100% right. And Thank my, you, question, uh, my question was just answered. Okay, all right. And we'll move to uh, Jim Brunner of the Seattle Times. Jim, if you wanna unmute, you can ask your question. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I uh, some of my questions got answered, but I, I guess I did want to return back to a couple things around the negotiations, the final night, and and, and the advice you got previous to that. Uh, one, my understanding is you were all at a Federal Way hotel or hotels physically. I'd like each of you to, I guess, affirm that maybe and 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 explain the thinking behind that and and what were you, how were you actually meeting, you know. Were you out in the hallways? Were you, what was the name of the hotel, et cetera? And then secondly, just on the Open Public Meetings Act issue, did you get advice from the attorney general's office or someone saying that this was okay to do in the, these partisan dyads, even though, you know, you're not the legislature, you're, you're you know, not necessarily, I, I'm not sure whether these caucuses were legal. Thank you. Well, I can at least answer the the first one. Um, you're you're right. Um, we all, for the last several days, decided that it, while we've been doing almost all of this by Zoom all year long, that it would be most fruitful to have us all uh, in one city. Um, just, if only because you know I was awake from 
5 a.m. Monday until 9 p.m. Tuesday, and trying to do that while while handling three kids at home, uh, at least for me, would have been a challenge. Um, I don't know the I don't know if I have the name of the hotel, the Courtyard Marriott, I think. Um, but um, uh, on your second question was about whether we received legal advice, you know, I, mean, you know, I, I don't want to get too far into legal advice or run myself into any privilege issues. Um, but uh, I can at least say that I guess two things on it. One, um, you know, we were keenly aware all year that um, you know, negotiating in these dyads, we knew that we could never reach actual agreement until we did it in an open public meeting. And then, um, you know, I, I'm just going to say what I said before too on the transparency issue. I we set a pretty high standard for ourselves. I personally believe in open government and the chaos of that last night, I think fell short of that. Yeah, I think I'll add, I think um, Commissioner Graves and I started uh, meeting in person um, at a conference room in a hotel uh, in federal way, I think sometime in October. Um, it's all a bit of a blur. I'd have to look at my calendar. I think there's, um, you know, there's a, the virtual space doesn't always allow you to develop the kind of relationships that you need to develop to successfully negotiate big things like this. Um, and meeting in person, we thought might um, aid our negotiations given the really truncated timeline we were working with. And, um, you know, then at some point in time um, when the negotiations started to get really sticky, uh, we decided to, you know, utilize the skills and the expertise of our chair uh, Sarah Augustine as a professional mediator to come in and help us, um, you know, kind of navigate some of these stickier parts and keep our negotiation on track. Um, and so I would be, I'd have to look at, look at my calendar and look at my notes. I think it was, yeah, we were some, somewhere in federal way, but uh, operating from separate meeting rooms um, and then coming together for discussion at various points. Okay, uh, next we'll go to uh, David Hyde with KUOW. David? Hey, yeah, just one uh, clarifying question. Um, I think Commissioner Sims and Fain both said that these maps had their full support. I didn't hear Commissioners Walkenshaw or Graves use that same language, um, or that you both voted for the agreement. So uh, I guess two questions. Do these final maps also have your full support? And I guess for everyone, would, does that mean you would all now vote for these maps? Well, let me be abundantly clear, and I issued a statement yesterday to this, and to this effect. Uh, those maps do reflect the agreement that I voted for. They have my support. I highly recommend, I, you know, I, I strongly recommend them to the court. Uh, my only hesitation was saying full support is because this process uh, with its bipartisan nature requires substantial compromises and you have to swallow pills that are hard to swallow. I think, I think I'll, probably all four of us would completely agree to that. So when I say they have my full support, what I mean is these are the maps that with this process, we work really hard to get to, I support them. I just, there are at least things in there that probably all of us will will say, shoot, man, if we had done it ourselves, we would have said something different. But that's the beauty of this process that the people themselves set up is it requires the parties themselves to swallow some bitter pills in the process so that uh, in a way that I think ultimately serves the people themselves. Yes, and I would agree. I urge, I would definitely urge the strong consideration of these maps to the Supreme Court. Um, and I also, um, you know, similar to what Commissioner Graves said, uh, this is this is a bipartisan process, and we reached a negotiated compromise at the end. Um, there are things that I agree with. There are things I don't agree with. Um, but that is what came out of this bipartisan process at the very end was this negotiated compromise, um, which I support. Um, I also will say the one area that I, I do have, you know, my one area that I, I left with reservations on has been around voting in the Yakima Valley, but that has been, I made that clear, it'll come out in public records, but I do support and urge the adoption um, by the court. Okay, it uh, looks like uh, we can go to uh, Jerry's, Jerry Cornfield again, he has his hand up, he's the last one here. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, thank you again. Um, looking forward and the relationship between the commission and the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court does not have resources as you did to, so have you already offered up staff and mapping resources to the Supreme Court? Have they asked for any? What do you 
envision this process will look like now in the next five months? We've had um, preliminary contact with um, the court clerk and offered uh, to the clerk all of uh, the resources that we have and including staff support. And um, one of the things that's really important to me is that we spent a lot of time and careful attention to recruiting as much public input as we could, as much as possible. And these, these maps reflect that process. We um, created a tribal consultation policy and um, the maps uh, reflect the interests that were communicated to us um, by the eight federally recognized tribes um, that engaged in consultation. Many communities of interest participated in the process. And so in, in our communication with the court, um, we are asking them to carefully consider all of that public input. I do want to underscore what Commissioner Augustine just said, and thank her as our chair. Um, we did have historic amount of public input. The tribal engagement process that the commission undertook um, was very important. Um, and you know, even having done this over Zoom during a pandemic, um, within a shorter time period, um, with you know, late, late arriving census data and a deadline that was moved up uh, from January 1 to mid-November. Um, in that compressed time period, there was just really extraordinary public input. Um, and I agree with what Commissioner Augustine said is about the transmission of this. It, it, it's really, really important. All right, uh, looks like we've got two more that want to follow up. So Daniel and Rich, I'm going to, Daniel, I'll go with you first. And then after Rich, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll wrap it up uh, one question each and I'll give the uh, commissioners an opportunity for a, a quick closing statement. Uh, Daniel, go ahead and unmute your um, uh, mic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just was uh, wondering, you mentioned uh, several technical issues. I'm sort of wondering if you can describe those and um, kind of was this um, you know, software associated with this? What actually specifically happened with those technical issues um, and you know, kind of why, yeah. Well, I can briefly take that uh, question. Um, not to be too negative, but there will probably be some follow-up conversations with uh, vendors and with future uh, and with future redistricting commissions in this and other states about some best practices around using uh, technology. Um, a lot of computers crashing. Uh, <laughs> even if you saw Zoom at the uh, eleven fifty nine meeting of the uh, of the commission uh, where uh, folks were uh, booted off and things froze uh, and then just the overall difficulty of the time it takes to, to actually do the work so there were uh, countless technological hang-ups and of various different kinds and um, again uh, I would say we need to account for those kind of things everyone knows the technology is fraught with problem and I think every I don't want to speak for my fellow commissioners but I don't think I'm stepping too far out on a limb by saying that uh, that uh, this work should not have been done at that uh, stage of the process or that late hour um, because it just increases the likelihood that you're going to face those kind of problems um, Okay, Rich Smith, if you have uh, another question, you can unmute and answer your question. Thanks, uh, Jamie. Yeah, just uh, um, sorry if I missed this earlier, but just wanted to clarify on the Voting Rights Act thing. Um, I know there's disagreement about which, um, uh, you know, about whether or not we need to be responsive to the Equal Protection Clause or the Voting Rights Act, but did each of you think that you were approving a map that complied with the Voting Rights Act because the UCLA analysis suggests that you didn't or that the map doesn't. And uh, Senator Billig said that he didn't think that the map uh, complied with the VRA. So just looking for clarification from each of you on, on, on whether or not you thought you were. Voting I'll, I'll go ahead and begin. And I, I do want to kind of correct one of the, the insinuations in the sentence there that, uh, that you know, we weren't all uh, concerned or didn't all think that uh, creating a map that complied with either the VRA or the equal protection um, or with equal protection was important. It absolutely is important. I think there's some disagreements around um, the legal interpretation of the VRA and what's required around it. I think you uh, saw as they were both made public differing legal analyses uh, about that. 
um, <clears throat> in particular to what was what ended up in the result, uh, I, I very much think it complies uh, with the with the VRA. Um, and I'm sure that there will be continued uh, conversation about uh, about that. Um, but I would say that uh, it, we remain very flexible on trying to present options um, uh, that would comply with the VRA. And I believe this end result, uh, the end result does that. I, you know, I'm not a attorney that's, that practices in this part of the law. So I don't want to uh, presume um, a higher sense of education on the I issue than is warranted. Uh, but I would say that there are definitely some flaws in the analyses that have been out there and some reliance on some cases that uh, aren't necessarily uh, upheld as uh, as current law. And so this is an ongoing conversation. There's going to be more conversation about it. But uh, um, I think at the end of the day, the end result is, is compliant um, and also provides uh, increased representation opportunities um, for, uh, for the, the community there in the Yakima Valley. I likewise believe that our map complies with the Voting Rights Act. It's a complicated area of the law. We spent a lot of time looking at it, analyzing it uh, with complicated areas of the laws like that. It probably will come as no surprise and then applying them in particular to the to any particular map. Uh, often the law is not anywhere close to being exactly clear, but the law does allow commissions, especially like ours, bipartisan commissions, uh, leeway in trying to draw them in a way that uh, complies with section two of the Voting Rights Act, and I believe what we've drawn here and agreed to complies. I think what I will say is that I, um, you know, that whether or not it complies with the Voting Rights Act is probably uh, something that I'll leave to the legal scholars. Um, but from my perspective, I was motivated to try to deliver something for the communities in Yakima. That being said, I fundamentally believe that those who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. And I will support the community in Yakima in whatever steps they want to take moving forward. Okay. Well, can I get on on that? Go ahead, Rich. I just wanted to make sure that I got your comment on that, uh, Walk and Show. Oh, I was going to say is I, I do think this will be an area of, I mean, I, I will first of all be specific that I, I urge the adoption of this by the court. So I, I, I support this map. Um, but this is the one area where I, I do disagree. Um, I, I think that there are real questions about the Voting Rights Act. Um, and I do um, think that there was a lot of analysis and, and the commissioners, we've all had long, long conversations about this. So my, my perspective on it has been, has been clear. Um, so I, I do think that this is an area that will continue to be discussed, um, but I, I urge the adoption of the maps and I, I did vote for them and I, I support them. So that, that's my, that's, I think there's, there's, there, there was an, a lot of analysis that Commissioner Graves commissioned. There was a lot of analysis that uh, I commissioned. Um, and I do think this will, this is just going to be an area of discussion into the future. Okay, thank you. All right, Nick, um, if you have, if you have a quick one, Nick, I'll let you jump in here real quick. Yeah, very quick. What is the number of the legislative district that will be majority Latino in the Yakima Valley? Does anyone know? 15. 15. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, I want to let the commissioners uh, have an opportunity for a couple of parting words. Uh, Commissioner Wakachoff, you'd like to start? Go right ahead. Sure, I would love to. Um, I want to just start by thanking everyone involved. Um, I, just to underscore what Commissioner Augustine said at the beginning, there was historic public input in this process. Um, we did it within some pretty extraordinary constraints. Um, the, the late census data, um, COVID, um, the technical issues that Commissioner Fain has alluded to, um, the fact that the, the deadline was moved up by 45 days. So we had a really abridged period um, to do this work. I, I know that all of us on this commission probably have ideas about ways the commission could be strengthened into the future. Um, one of those is uh, bringing the census data release closer to the time we actually have to submit maps so that we can engage in kind of the transparency that I think we, we would aspire to um, at, at all moments. Um, so that's one point. And I wanna thank Chair Augustine. I wanna thank Commissioner Sims. I wanna thank Commissioner Graves, Commissioner Fain. Um, there was a lot of work in this process. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, the second thing is that I do genuinely regret that we were unable to um, submit the maps by the deadline. Um, that said, we took a, a vote on Monday night. I am support of that agreement that we took, the, the agreement that the commissioners on this call um, 
explain this was a bipartisan process. And from this process, we reached a negotiated compromise. Um, so these maps have now been submitted to the court um, who has jurisdiction and I urge their strong consideration um, in the court's next steps. So that's that's my belief. And um, while, we, while there are certainly areas that we had disagreement, um, we touched on one of them. Um, that, that's my perspective. Um, and I appreciate, I really appreciate the work of this body. Commissioner Fink. Thank you. I, you know, I echo um, Commissioner Walkinshaw's comments. I definitely want to thank Commissioner Walkinshaw, Sims, uh, and uh, Graves for really putting uh, an effort forward to do a very tough thing under very tough conditions. Uh, I, I particularly segment out the work of our chair, uh, Commissioner Augustine. I we had a lot of disagreements amongst the four of us about uh, about this process and about uh, elements of maps and partisanship and communities. I think there is one thing that the four of us remained uh, astutely unified on is that the very first decision that this uh, body made uh, to select her as the chair uh, was uh, without dispute, the correct choice. Uh, she was tasked with a near impossible job and uh, helped shepherd us through uh, to a conclusion that while the homework was turned in late, it was completed. Uh, and we, we urge now, as we hear each of the commissioners are urging the Supreme Court to uh, to adopt these maps. And I think that's a strong uh, I think that's a strong case to be made that we um, that we made a lot of progress in this process and that we ended up with a with a, a good product. Um, I also echo the comments that have been made earlier that, you know, process does matter. And uh, the final hours of this fell short of the um, of the values that I have in open government. Um, and that uh, and that when deadlines are approaching, tough choices are made. And I, I think it's pretty clear that uh, that we could have and should have done better. Uh, that being said, um, the end result is something that uh, that we support, and I have high confidence that it uh, is something that will end up becoming uh, law. Uh, and I certainly, you know, pledge any support, resources, or availability that I can to the court and their process, um, so that they can see that there is a unified position about. Um, the future of, of this plan for the state of Washington. So again, I, I thank deeply uh, each of my colleagues um, for their efforts on this. This is uh, one of the harder things I think each of us has ever had to undertake. Uh, one of the toughest Rubik's cubes to solve. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the work was done. Um, and uh, don't call me in 10 years. Uh, Commissioner Sims. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. I, I think, I would, I, you know, serving on this commission has been a real privilege and an honor. Um, and I want to thank uh, Speaker Jenkins for appointing me to serve on the commission for her trust and her faith in me. And I am really grateful for all that I've learned in this process. I would be remiss if I didn't give a special shout out to my chief of staff and co-strategist Osta Davis for her brilliant mind and impeccable work ethic. Not all heroes wear capes, Osta. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the things that I want to lift up is that, you know, modern day politics has become so polarizing and in a high stakes bipartisan process like this, it could have easily dissolved into something toxic and ineffective. But I think the structure of this process that brings people together from opposing political parties and often wildly different backgrounds, um, this process of bringing us together for a shared purpose to protect fair elections and the foundation of our democracy that one person, one vote is a fundamental principle, um, it works. Um, and it certainly worked in this case. I, I wanna thank all of the commissioners, our chair, Sarah Augustine, who was amazing. I mentioned when negotiations started to break down, her mediation skills brought us back together and uh, is largely the, the reason we were able to reach agreement. I will lift up that these uh, were some of the hardest negotiations not some, these were absolutely the hardest negotiations I've ever been through, mostly because my Republican counterpart in the House, Paul Graves, was such a formidable representative for his caucus and his party. And I wanna thank him for negotiating so fiercely with me. Uh, we both gave a little, we both got a little, um, and I'm really proud of the work that we did. Uh, I, wanna, I do again wanna thank Brady for his leadership in the Yakima region and for making it a priority. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Fain for his work negotiating uh, with Brady on the uh, congressional maps. And it really has been a true privilege. 
I would say, uh, lastly, that uh, these maps are legitimate and that any statements to suggest otherwise are a calculated attempt to undermine our de democratic process. Planting seeds of doubt about our maps deteriorates trust in our de democratic institutions and the norms that we as a country hold so dear, and we must vigilantly guard against this. One person, one vote is a foundational principle, and I was privileged to play a role in this. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Graves? I believe deeply in this process. In the majority of states where the legislature itself draws these lines, you have some of the worst kind of politics. You have elected officials choosing their own voters rather than the other way around. You have naked, naked partisan power plays, which undermines the people's trust in our democracy and their ability to uh, vote, to turn their votes into representatives and legislators they support. And I'm really proud of the people in 1983 for choosing a different path, for choosing this process that we have here right now, where two Republicans, two Democrats are appointed independently and separately and cannot uh, run for office, cannot currently be in office and cannot run for office for at least two years. So we remove self-interest from this process and instead uh, fight for maps that ultimately are fair and that reflect substantial compromise from both parties. Because at the end of the day, that's the best way for the people themselves to choose to chart their own path in democracy. I, all, as with everybody else, um, this, the members of this commission are to a person, people that you in Washington can be very proud of. Um, all of them, but especially our chair, Sarah Augustine. Um, she, uh, it's, it's gotta be one of the most challenging things to do because she doesn't have a vote. And so she told us pretty regularly, I don't have a vote here. So I can't, it's not like I can force you to do anything or say anything, um, but she's a mediator, she's from Yakima. Having her on this commission was among the more valuable things that we've had happen this year. And again, I think ultimately at the end of the day, this process worked. It resulted in maps that are fair, that reflect substantial compromise, and that I think we all agree the court itself should adopt. Chair Augustine. Thank you, Jamie. I wanna say that I believe in this commission. I believe in the process of bipartisan cooperation and the ability to find a middle road, even when it's hard. That's right in principle, but I believe in this commission and I want to state that support. The individuals in this commission, this is a historic commission. It's the most diverse uh, ethnically that we've ever had in Washington state. This is the first commission where every commissioner um, had a full-time job and was under 50. This is an amazing group of people. And I wanna name some, um, some qualities of each one. Um, Paul Graves um, is fair, considerate, um, and kind. April Sim is uh, just a fabulous leader and uh, and she's well-spoken, articulate, and passionate. And Joe Fain has shown himself to be gentle, consistent, um, and uh, and has lead, and is a leader for um, for his values. And Brady Walkinshaw has also shown himself to be committed to the values that he's espoused. Um, not only in word, but also in his action. So um, this, I'm proud of this commission. I'm proud of the work that they did. We did not um, complete the work by midnight, the statutory deadline. However, we did complete the work. And I urge the court to give these maps full consideration. This is especially important given the amount of effort that myself, my staff, um, my fellow commissioners and all of their staff expanded drawing in the most input that we could from the public and honoring that input in the final form. So I urge the court to consider all of those things as they embark on the process. Thank you. Thank you all very much. On that note, that'll uh, conclude the event. Uh, thank you for coming and um...